Hi, welcome back. Can you invest without knowing how to value an asset? Well, most people do, so I guess you can. But I firmly believe that if you really want to invest wisely, you need to understand valuation. Now, valuation can take an entire course. As you, as you well know, I do teach an entire class on valuation. But I want to give you a compressed version of all the valuation you need to know in order to do investing. So let's get to the basics. When I think about valuation, I go back to that financial balance sheet I introduced in the session on accounting, on financial statements. And in a financial balance sheet, if you remember, I break down assets into assets in place, investments you've already made, and growth assets, investments I expect you to make in the future. On the other side of the balance sheet, of course, you can use debt or equity to fund a business. The reason I like a financial balance sheet as a vehicle to, to, to start talking about valuation is when you sit down to do valuation, you have to make a decision. Do you want to value just the equity in a business or do you want to value the entire business? Sounds like I'm splitting hairs, right? But there's a big difference. You can have a valuable business where equity is worth nothing. How can that happen? Well, if you borrow enough money, you can make the most valuable business have little or no equity. You can also have a valuable business where equity is worth a great deal. So I think in a sense, making that judgment is a critical one. Because once you make that judgment, everything you do in valuation is driven by that decision you made up front. If you decide to value equity, and just equity, you got to wear blinders. You got to focus on just the cash flows you get as equity investors and discount those cash flows back at a rate of return you would demand for investing in the equity of a company, which of course is the cost of equity, the rate of return in equity, reflecting the risk of the equity. If you decide to value the whole business, however, you're going to be looking at the cash flows to the whole business, not just the equity investors. You're saying, who else gets cash flows? Well, the bankers do, right? They get interest and principal payments. The collective cash flow you get from the business, that's a pre-debt cash flow, discounted back at a weighted average of what the equity investors want, which is the cost of equity, and what the lenders want, which is the cost of debt, which in corporate finance, of course, is the cost of capital, gives you the value of the entire business. Now, the reason I, I would push you to make that judgment up front is if you think about value of business, the value of a business rests on four pillars. There are four questions you need to answer for me to value a business. The first question I'm going to ask you is going to be a precise one. What are the cash flows you're getting from your existing assets? You've already made some investments on the ground. Those investments are producing cash flows. What do those cash flows look like? Now again, I'm going to wear two hats. If I'm valuing the equity in a business, the cash flows I need to know are cash flows after debt payments, after interest and principal payments. Whereas if I'm valuing the entire business, the cash flows I would like to know are cash flows before debt payments. Now, where would I get these numbers? If I'm looking at existing assets, odds are I'm starting with the existing financial statements, the existing net income, the existing operating income, trying to, to get a sense at least of what those cash flows are from existing assets. So that's the first stop. What are your cash flows from existing assets? And as you can see, the answer is going to be different depending on whether I'm valuing the business or valuing equity. Second stop along the way, how much value will you be adding with future growth? Now, if you think about growth, growth can come from two places. It can come from new investments you make as a business, which expands the size of your company. It can also come from running your existing businesses more efficiently. I'm giving you leeway to tell me growth from both dimensions, but I'm going to check. I'm going to make sure that the growth rate you give me is in fact sustainable given the amount of new investments you plan to make and given the potential for efficiency in your company. So how much are your cash flows? How quickly are you going to grow? And even the question on growth, the answer is going to vary depending upon whether I value equity or the business. If I'm valuing equity, the growth rate I need is a growth rate in equity income, net income, earnings per share. If I'm valuing the business, the growth rate I need is a growth rate in operating income, earnings before interest in taxes. So essentially, the answers to the first two questions already you can see are going to be different depending on whether you're valuing equity or the business. Third question I'm going to ask you is, what discount rate should I apply on these cash flows? And if you chose to give me equity growth rates and equity cash flows, the discount rate you should be giving me is a cost of equity. If you're giving me cash flows before debt payments and a growth in operating income, the discount rate you have to give me is a cost of capital. But underlying both discount rates is the risk of the business. So how discretionary is your product? What are your fixed costs? In other words, the economics are what drive the cost of equity and capital, not just numbers you plug in. 
There's a final question I'm going to ask you, and it's going to sound like a strange one, but, but, but hang in there anyway. I'm going to ask you, how long will it be before you become a mature company? Now, your first reaction might be, what's a mature company? A mature company is a company that grows at a rate less than or equal to the economy. Why do I need to know? Well, I can't estimate cash flows forever. And a publicly traded company, at least in theory, can last forever. However, I can stop estimating cash flows if I'm willing to make an assumption that at some point in time in the future, five years out, ten years out, my cash flows start growing at a constant rate forever. Now, do you see the connection? If you can tell me when your company will be a mature company, a company growing at a rate less than or equal to the economy, I can make the assumption that at that point in time, my cash flows start growing at a constant rate forever. What does that buy me? It allows me to compute the present value of all those cash flows with one equation. That equation yields, of course, the, most, the biggest number in any valuation, which is the terminal value, the value at the end of the period. I discount the cash flows during my, my high growth period and the terminal value back to the present, I get a value for the business today. Should be simple enough, right? So let's spend a few minutes talking about the inputs that go into the process. Let's start with cash flows. As I said, it's key to remember who you're estimating the cash flows to. Cash flows can either be to equity investors in a business or the entire business. If you're looking at cash flows to equity investors, the simplest measure of that cash flow, the cash flow that we've been using the longest period, is the actual cash flow paid out to equity investors. In a publicly traded company, that might take the form of dividends. Or it might take the form of dividends and stock buybacks, because stock buybacks are also cash return to equity investors. So the lazy person's way of estimating cash flows to equity is just look at what cash is actually paid out to equity investors. But we know conclusively that companies don't always pay out what they can afford to in dividends and buybacks. How do we know that? Well, we know many companies hold back cash because they have big cash balances. In fact, for every billion dollars in cash flows available to be paid out, I wouldn't be surprised if only 600 million or 700 million out of the billion dollars gets paid out. So there's a second measure of cash flow equity that requires you to do some estimation. What I'd like you to tell me is what the potential dividend in a company is. Sounds difficult to do, right? But it's actually fairly simple. Look at the cash flows left over after every conceivable need has been met. So start with the net income because after all, that is the income to equity investors. Add back depreciation, subtract out capital expenditures because that's cash out of the firm. Subtract out any investments you have to make in working capital. Subtract out any debt repayments you have to make. And if you're borrowing money that's cash coming into the firm, add up all those numbers, you have what's called the free cash flow to equity. Fancy name for potential dividend, but if you don't trust what the company is returning to its stockholders as, as cash flows, then this is the way to do it. Estimate what they could have returned to the stockholders. So both the conventional dividends and stock buybacks and the free cash flow to equity are cash flows to equity investors. Now, what if you have to estimate cash flows the business? Not that difficult. Just climb the income statement. Start with the operating income. Why? Because you want to look at income before interest expenses. Act like you pay taxes on the operating income. It's not actual taxes you're computing. It's a hypothetical tax. What would you have paid on the operating income? Act like you have no interest expenses. You say, why would I want to do that? Interest saves me taxes. You're right. But we will actually show the tax savings from interest in the cost of capital. We'd, so the cash flows should therefore not include those same tax savings a second time. So start with the operating income, net out the, the, uh, that hypothetical tax, then subtract out what you need to reinvest, which is going to take the form of reinvestment in long-term assets. It's a difference between capital expenditures and depreciation and how much your working capital is going to go up. That's the investment in working capital. What you're left with then is the free cash flow to the firm. It's free because it's after taxes and after reinvestment needs. It's a cash flow because in a sense I've added back depreciation and amortization and it's to the firm because it's before debt payments. So first stop, get these numbers nailed down. Generally you will pull these numbers right out of the most recent financial statements and you'll have the cash flows from existing assets. Second stop in the process, let's think about discount rates. There are lots of individual inputs that go into discount rates. I'm going to do a very quick tour of what these numbers will be. When you sit down to estimate discount rates, the first decision you have to make is what currency you're going to estimate the discount rate in. Now, you've already estimated the cash flows, right? Whichever currency you chose to estimate the cash flows in is also the currency in which you have to estimate the discount rate. So if you're valuing a Mexican company in pesos, 
your cash flows are in pesos, then your discount rate has to be in pesos. If you choose to value that Mexican company in US dollars, your cash flows have to be in US dollars, your discount rate has to be in US dollars. Now you might wonder why I'm making such a big deal about the currency. But the risk-free rate, the, the starting point for your discount rate has to be in that currency. So if I'm doing my valuation in US dollars, my risk-free rate has to be in US dollars. If I'm doing my valuation in pesos, my risk-free rate has to be in pesos. For something to be risk-free though, there can be no default risk in it and I have to know my expected returns with certainty. That's kind of a tough, the tough thing to pull off. Now if I have to estimate a risk-free rate in US dollars, historically what people have done is they've used the US Treasury bond rate, the long-term 10-year or the 30-year bond rate as the risk-free rate. Implicitly we're assuming no default risk in the US Treasury. It gets a little more difficult if you have to estimate a risk-free rate in Mexican pesos because if you take the government bond rate in Mexico in pesos, that might not be a risk-free rate if you think there's default risk in the Mexican government. So the first step in this process is to clean up that rate and get a risk-free rate in pesos or dollars or euros or whatever currency you're working in. So for the cost of equity, I'm going to start with the risk-free rate as a base. Then I'm going to go across and ask a different question. If I were investing in the average risk stock, what kind of risk premium would I demand? That's called the equity risk premium. Now, there are some people who estimate this number by looking backwards, by looking at the last 50, 60, 80 years. And if you look at the last 86 years, for instance, stocks in the U.S. have earned about 4 to 5 percent more than T-bonds. You can use that as a historical risk premium. The problem with doing that, of course, is it's backward looking. An alternative approach of the equity risk premium is to estimate what markets are pricing in as the premium right now. Sounds fancy, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the level of stock prices today and back out from them what the implied equity risk premium is. That number in, in March of 2013 at least was about 5.5 to 6 percent. So I've got a risk-free rate in whatever currency I've chosen to do the analysis in, a risk premium either obtained by either looking backwards or with an implied premium. There's one final number I need for a cost of equity. I need a measure of relative risk, and we talked about this in the earlier session. The relative risk measure, if you buy into the CAPM, is going to be a beta, but if even if you don't, just give me some measure of relative risk. What do I mean by relative risk? Tell me whether your stock is one time, one and a half times, two times, three times, or half as much as risky as the average stock in the market. That becomes my beta. Risk-free rate plus, plus beta times equity risk premium gives me a cost of equity. To get the cost of, cost of debt, which is what I need for the cost of capital, I'm going to start with the same risk-free rate, but to that risk-free rate, I'm going to add a default spread. We talked about this in an earlier session, but the default spread reflects the credit risk of your company, and I can obtain a default spread by either looking up an actual rating for a company, if I can find one, or estimating a rating, a synthetic rating for the company. The objective, though, is I come up with a spread that I add to the risk-free rate. I have a cost of debt. If I have a tax advantage to debt, I'm going to net out that tax advantage to come up with an after-tax cost of borrowing. So I've got a cost of equity. I've got an after-tax cost of debt. The weights I should be using for my cost of capital are market value weights. I bring them in. I've got a cost of capital. Key thing to remember about the cost of capital. It doesn't have to be the same number all the way through your valuation. If you have a young, high-growth company, odds are your cost of capital will be really high today. Why? Because your equity is really risky. A beta will be a high number, and you're not using any debt. You can't afford to borrow money. But as you go through time and you make your company larger, more stable, more profitable, you should bring your cost of capital down to reflect the assumptions you're making about growth. So keep that option open, allowing your discount rates to change over time. So that's cash flows and discount rates. Let's do some valuation. So let's say you've decided to value business. The business expects to generate $120 million in after-tax earnings and cash flow each year in perpetuity. So there's no growth. You're going to make $120 million year one, year two, year three, year four, and you're going to keep doing this forever. The firm is all equity funded. There's no debt, and the cost of equity is 10%. What's the value of this business? Now, if you understand basic present value, here's what you have. You have a perpetuity. A perpetuity is a constant cash flow forever, $120 million every year forever. The present value of a perpetuity is very simple. It's just the cash flow divided by the discount rate. In this case, you divide $120 million. By 0 0.10, you come up with a value of $1.2 billion. You're done. That's the value of the business. The value of the business is 1.2 billion, it's 120 million divided by 0 0.10. 
What's the value of equity in this business? And say, oh, no money. The value of equity in this business is one hundred and twenty. Is is also one point two billion. If they'd owed money, I'd have subtracted from the one point two billion. But that's the value of equity in the business. Let's say there were a hundred million shares outstanding. Okay, what's the value of equity per share? A one point two billion dollars divided by a hundred million shares outstanding gives me a value of equity per share of about twelve dollars per share. Hey, that's it. You've done valuation. That was easy, right? Now let's up the ante a little bit. What would happen if I told you that this company, in addition to having 100 million shares outstanding, also had granted options to its managers? Those options are still out there. There are 20 million options outstanding. But to kind of alleviate your concern, I said, don't worry. Those options are at the money options. They're actually at the same price that the rest of the shares are. We value the shares at $12. These options have a strike price of $12. Would you worry about these options? I would. Even though these options have no value today, they're options, which means they could have value in the future. So any time you have options outstanding on top of existing shares, remember your value of equity per share is going to be impacted by the existence of those options. So that's it. We have did a very simple valuation. Let's start thinking about growth. Let's assume I told you that the firm that I described on the last page is going to grow at 2% a year forever. Okay? Now, this is called a growing perpetuity, and most people, when you ask them to value growing perpetuity, will take the cash flow and divide by the difference between the discount rate and the growth rate. So you remember the cash flow on the previous page was 120 million, your discount rate was 10%, and your growth rate is 2%. 120 million goes in the numerator, 0 0.10 minus 0 0.02, the, the discount rate minus the growth rate goes in the denominator. 120 divided by 0 0.08, gives me 1.5 billion. Magic. I've increased the value by 300 million. I can't stop myself now. I try a 4% growth rate. 120 million cash flow divided by 0 0.10 minus 0 0.04. That gives me 2 billion. Is there no end to this game? Well, if I made it 6%, I could make it 3 billion. It's so easy to increase value, right? But there are two fundamental problems with what I've done on this page. One is I've let the growth rate run away from me. Remember, the growth rate is a growth rate you can sustain forever. It cannot be greater than the growth rate of the economy. And if my risk-free rate is only 2 or 3 or 4%, I can't grow, to grow at 6%. That's the first problem. The second is growth is not free. Let me explain what I mean by that. If you think about where growth comes from, growth has to come from a company reinvesting, especially if I'm talking about growth forever. And in fact, there's a very simple equation that relates how much I reinvest to my growth rate and return on capital. So basically, this is an algebraic equation. It's not theory. It's not some hypothesis. It's a truism. The reinvestment rate, the amount of money that I put back into the business, is a function of how quickly I grow and what my return on capital is. So let me return to the previous example. Remember, I had $120 million in after-tax operating income, right? I want to grow 2% a year. If I have a return on capital of 10%, that will mean that I have to reinvest 2 over 10, 20% of $120 million back into the business. So rather than have a cash flow of $120 million, which is what I had when I had zero growth, I'm going to have $120 million minus 20% of $120 million, which is $24 million, gives me a cash flow of $96 million. That's the cash flow I should be discounting if I'm looking at a 2% growth rate. 96 million divided by 0 0.10, which is my cost of equity, divide, minus the 2% growth rate, gives me 1.2 billion. Magic. I put in a 2% growth rate, my value did not change. You can try the 4% growth rate. With a 4% growth rate, my reinvestment has to be 40%, 4 over 10. I take 40% out of 120 million, that's 48 million out of the numerator, my cash flow becomes 72 million. 72 divided by 0 0.10 minus 0.04. 1.2 billion. Again, my value doesn't change. You're saying, what's going on here? Here's what's happening. Whatever I gain by growing faster, I'm exactly losing by having to put money back to get the growth. It brings home a critical lesson about growth. Growth is not free. It's a function of how much you reinvest and how well you reinvest. How I measure those two numbers will depend on whether I'm looking at equity income or operating income. If I'm looking at equity income, how much I grow, reinvest will be what percentage of the net income I put back into the business. It's one minus the payout ratio. That's called the retention ratio. And how well I reinvest is going to be measured by what kind of return I make on the equity that I invest in a project. That's a return on equity. 
So if I retain 80% of my earnings and I earn a 20% return equity, my net income is going to grow by, tw by 20% times 80%, 16% a year. If I'm trying to estimate growth in operating income, how much I reinvest is going to be captured by looking at what my net capex and change in working capital, that's my reinvestment is each year, as a percentage of my after-tax operating income. And how well I reinvest is going to be captured by my return on capital. That's basically my after-tax uh, after operating income divided by the invested capital in the company. Here's the key lesson about growth. It's easy to grow. Any company can grow. You can just go buy growth. But to grow and create value, you've got to earn a return on capital that exceeds your cost of capital or a return on equity that exceeds your cost of equity. If all you do is grow and make your cost of capital, which was the case in the previous example, then growth becomes pointless. So High growth is easy, quality growth is rare, rare because to pull off poor quality growth, you've got to pull off a pretty tough trick. You've got to reinvest a lot and reinvest well at the same time. And the larger you get as a company, the more difficult it will be to keep doing this. Why? Because if you're a small company, you can reinvest a lot and reinvest well because you're in a niche market. As you get larger, this will get more and more difficult to do. And finally, and this is a point worth emphasizing, you can grow and destroy value at the same time. How can that happen? Well, if you grow and while and the way you grow is by reinvesting huge amounts at returns in capital that are less than the cost of capital, you will destroy value. In fact, try this out in the last example. I had a return in capital of 10%, which was set equal to my cost of capital of 10%. See what will happen if you set your return on capital at 8% and you have a 4% growth rate. You're going to be amazed at how much value you can destroy by growing. So that's intrinsic valuation. You can see the pieces of the puzzle. You've got the cash flows, you've got a discount rate, reflecting how you estimated the cash flows, what currency, whether it's equity or firm. And you have a growth rate that's tied to how much you reinvest. So if you increase your growth rate, make sure you check to your reinvestment to make sure you're putting in enough money into the business to allow it to grow. So intrinsic valuation is like a finely tuned clock. You've got to keep all these pieces moving together. And the bane of intrinsic valuation is when you become inconsistent. Inconsistent in what sense? You let the growth become high while letting risk become low and not reinvest any money. You're going to create a money machine. So make sure that you are being internally consistent. Now, most people out there don't do intrinsic valuation. It's too much work or it's too constraining. Most of the valuations you see out there are relative valuations. What's a relative valuation? In a relative valuation, the value of an asset is estimated by looking at how the market price is similar or comparable assets. In fact, if you've ever bought a house, you've done relative valuation. Your realtor gave you a number based on what similar properties sold for. Philosophically, in relative valuation, you say, you're, you're, you're basically saying, I don't know what the intrinsic value is. I'm going to let the market tell me what something is worth. And if you break down relative valuation, the other three ingredients you're going to see. You're going to see either exactly identical asset, which is very tough to find, or a group of comparable or similar assets. A standardized measure of the price. Sounds fancy, but basically you're going to see price divided by something. Price by earnings, price by book, earnings, enterprise value by EBITDA. Basically a multiple is just a standardized price. And if the assets are not completely comparable and the analyst is careful, you're going to control for differences across those variables. Finally, if you think about how you make money of relative valuation, you're essentially assuming that markets are right on average, but that they make mistakes on individual companies. So essentially, you're hoping those mistakes get found and fixed, and you hope to make money off that. So let's try this. Okay? Let's assume you're trying to value a company. This is from a very old table that I have of telecom ADRs in the U.S. So these are foreign telecom companies that were listed in the U.S. in the late 90s. So as an example, I'm going to take a company, Telebrass, the second company on the list, and I like it because it has a really low PE. So I try to put a buy recommendation. I said, this is a cheap stock. It's trading at a price earnings ratio well below the average for the sector. And that's true, right? So think about what I might be missing. I have a company with a low PE. It looks cheap. But here are some of the variables that affect PE. Growth affects PE. If you have low growth, then you're going to have a low PE. So the first thing I check for is what the growth rate in these companies was. And there's my first concern. Telebrass has a low PE, but it has one of the lowest growth rates in the sector. So concern one is being registered. 
The other concern is if you look at these companies, some are emerging market telecom companies, and this is in the late 90s when emerging markets were really risky, and some are developed market telecom companies. Holding all else constant, the riskier a company is, the lower the P-E ratio should be. So that's my second concern, is how risky is Telebras, and could that explain why the P-E ratio is 8.9? So when you think about adjusting for variables and relative valuation, you have to take into account You've got to dot your I's and cross your T's. You've got to control for cash flows, growth, and risk. In other words, those variables we talked about in intrinsic valuation should also be part of your repertoire when you use relative valuation. So here are my closing thoughts on valuation. Valuation is simple. Don't make it too complex because it'll get in the way. Okay? Second, the biggest enemy of good valuations are the biases and preconceptions we bring into the process. If you enter a valuation telling yourself this is the greatest company in the face of the earth, well, you're going to find out that the company is undervalued. So try to keep your biases out of the process. Very tough to do. I'm not saying it's going to be easy to do, but at least be honest with yourself. Third, remember, you will never be able to value a business precisely. You have an estimate, be, and be okay with it. You're going to be wrong, but you don't have to be right. All you have to do is be less wrong than everybody else. And it's, in fact, those companies where you feel most uncomfortable, where you feel there's mo the most imprecision, the young growth companies, where you have the biggest shot of being ahead of the, the crowd because most people don't even try valuing these companies. And finally, building bigger models will not necessarily give you the tools to do better valuations. So I think it's worth putting in the resources, spending some time learning valuation. If you're interested, I have an entire class on valuation you can sit through, but you might lose your patience halfway through, but that's still going to be enough tools to value most companies you run into. But I think if you want to invest wisely, you need to know the value of what you're investing in, and that's a focus of valuation. So in summary, we've talked about two approaches to valuation. Intrinsic valuation, we value an asset based on its cash flows, growth, and risk making sure you're internally consistent. And relative valuation, we value company looking at other companies out there that you think are just like your company. But since there are no companies just like yours, you might use a multiple and comparables, but make sure you control for differences on growth, risk, and cash flows across companies. That's about it. Thank you very much for listening.